Were the utopian socialists for real? Was Fourier's phalanx a model city or a model resort? Why did none of their schemes work? These and other questions will be answered right after this. I'm Professor Jerome Arkenberg, and I've been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you about why, how, and when socialism first emerged, why socialism and socialists embraced industrialization, but not the system that produced it the first socialist schemes and models, and why none of them actually worked. At the end, I'll have the wrap-up quote on this video, so be sure to stick around for that. But first, make sure to click like, share, especially subscribe, and that little bell thingy, so I can continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. In 1798, Thomas Malthus, seen here, born in 1766, died in 1834, published an essay on population, the first real scientific study of demography, and concluded that, far from Adam Smith's free market capitalism producing a utopia, it would produce disaster and suffering for all, especially the workers, due to a population explosion. Now, follow this graph here. This was because the amount of food, he said, the earth can produce is finite. Now remember, this is 1798. Chemical fertilizers, genetic modifying of plants has not yet occurred. So according to, as far as he knew, the amount of food the earth can produce is finite, set by the amount of land available. So when the population grows, it presses upon a narrowing margin of subsistence. And when this margin is exhausted, famine must follow, for population increases exponentially, while food only increases arithmetically. Now, that's not actually true, but he believed it was true, and as we will certainly see, others of his time believed it was true and cause them to, well, hold on, let's see. So, according to Malthus, a free market, capitalist society, left to itself, would inevitably proceed to a living hell, which caused some, not all, but some, to reject the world of Adam Smithian economic liberalism and instead embrace various schemes of governmental control to save society. These reformers, called utopian socialists by Karl Marx, even though Marxism itself is kind of utopian. Anyway, these reformers thought to persuade the upper classes, the owning classes, that social change would be to their own benefit bringing forth a new society based on love thy neighbor, not gouge thy neighbor. Now, really one of the earliest ones in Europe is this guy, Count Claude Henri de Saint-Simon. He's born in 1760, dies in 1825. In his The New Christianity, was the first to reject 
free market capitalism's emphasis on self-sufficiency and the individual, urging state intervention, social planning, property law changes, and establishment of social and economic equality. Unfortunately, not much came of it. Then, Robert Owen, from 1771 to 1858, the owner of several textile mills, believed after a while that even the poor could be productive and virtuous if given the chance to work in a decent environment at a decent wage. Oh my goodness, they might even live decently. As you can tell, the upper classes, what's called the owning classes, had a very poor opinion of the poor. In his factory at New Lanark in Scotland, seen here, Owen limited the workday from 18 to 10 hours. Oh my goodness. And provided his workers decent homes, healthcare benefits, old age insurance and pensions, and then saw both worker productivity and his own profits increase, causing him to become a great advocate, especially of labor unions when the government and his own fellow industrialists refused to follow his lead. Later, Owen tried to establish a planned utopia in New Harmony, Indiana, but unfortunately attracted mostly slackers and failed. Thinking that labor could be freed from the coercion, misery, and exploitation of pre-market capitalism, Charles Fourier, a Frenchman, born in 1772, died in 1837, thought of doing this by creating ancient communities based on the phalanx. This was an ancient Greek military formation based on close group coordination. All these guys were classically educated. Built by governments across the world in these phalanxes, an entire population would live and work in a complex, kind of like a resort hotel, or certainly a planned city, except that around it would be factories and cultivated fields where the population would work. So efficiency would be achieved through utter centralization. And all would work, adults, children, even the elderly, for at least a few hours a day. But each would only work at what they like best and only for a few hours at a time, at which point they would rotate. So it's like they would start out, I don't know, let's say making beds and then cleaning and then cooking and then working in the factory and then working on the athletic fields and something like that. So the, it's kind of like in volleyball where people rotate from one position to another. So the same thing goes here. So this way there would never be a problem with the alienating, miserable, soul killing work typical of free market capitalism. One person to the same job, 12, 15, 18 hours a day over and over again you would simply rotate to a different job. Not a bad idea. But who did the really dirty work? Why children who liked to play in the mud and garbage? He apparently, Fourier apparently had a very poor idea about children. Anyway, children, so hordes of children organized into juvenile legions would go off to work maintaining and building roads, housing, factories, public works, even hauling away garbage and slaughtering animals while having the time of their lives. Yes, even the five-year-olds and six-year-olds and seven-year-olds, maybe even four-year-olds would go out 
and have fun slaughtering cattle and pigs, repaving a road, building a factory. And according to Fourier, the profits from the agricultural industrial enterprises of these phalanxes would be 30% or more, all of course invested back in the community that produced them. And everyone, every single person in the phalanx and thus around the world would be happy, well-fed, healthy, and content. Over 40 such phalanxes were established in the United States in the 1820s and 30s, including Robert Owen's failed New Harmony before Owen took it over. But the impracticality of the scheme led to utter failure for each. Another utopian socialist is Etienne Cabet, seen here, who lived from 1788 to 1856, and in his 1840 work, Voyage to Icaria, proposed an association similar to Fourier's but more strict and authoritarian. The problem with Fourier, many people joined up and then simply refused to do any work. But in this case, you will be forced to work. And one such, New Acaria, was built in Iowa, but it too failed miserably. Louis Blanc, whom we've encountered elsewhere, in the 1830-1848 uh, revolutions, 1811-1882, in his Organization of Labor, published in 1839, argued that to achieve labor's full yield, workers must be organized into cooperatives. He called national workshops, where workers would control and determine all production. There wouldn't be any managers, just all the workers getting together distributing all profits back to the workers in the form of dividends, social benefits, and reinvestment in their workshops. During the 1848 revolution, the French government established hundreds of Blanc's national workshops across the country. But all failed because, guess what? The workers never did any work. The wrap-up quote. Where then is freedom? It most certainly exists for those who have the means of enjoying it and making it bear fruit. For those who own the soil, who have money, credit, and the thousand resources that culture and intelligence provide. These people have so much that they can even abuse it. But is it the same for that numerous class that has neither land, nor capital, nor credit, nor instruction, that has nothing that would enable the individual to manage for himself and develop his faculties? How will society be made to give suitable instruction and the necessary instruments of labor to every one of its members, if not by the intervention of the state? We want a strong government because there are weak persons who need a social force to protect them. We want a government that will intervene in industry because in an arena where people make loans only to the rich, a social banker is needed who will lend to the poor. In a word, we are invoking the idea of power because the freedom of the future must be a reality. The seedbed of socialism can be fertilized only by the wind of politics. Louis Blanc, 1839. Let me know what you think of this quote in the comment section below. Also, what you liked about this video and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to click like, share, and especially subscribe, as it will help me bring you 
more great videos just like this one and click on that little bell thingy so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past.